hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to uh, another episode of Strange Playgrounds. A lot of them coming out at the moment, it seems, on lots and lots of different subjects. And tonight I'm really, really, really pleased because I've got a guest again. Uh, someone you'll all probably know from quite a few previous videos now, uh, but primarily probably from uh, videos about her short story collection, Sing Your Sadness Deep. And also a discussion on when the wind blows, which, by the way, Laura, have you seen the numbers on that one? It's ridiculous. Right? I didn't realise so many people wanted to be so miserable. What the hell's <laughs> going on there? We were all very, very depressed. That's what's going Clearly. on there. Clearly. <laughs> I mean, people responded to that. Like, and I... you know, in, in these days of YouTube, with the algorithm being what it is, it's actually really hard to get those kinds of views. <laughs> I can't say I'm surprised if it is when the wind blows that has done it, because I think it just when we were talking about it, you realise just how much of a cultural impact it had. Yeah. And how, but more importantly, how much it still it still has. Well, yeah, I think people were just traumatised by it, weren't they? Like, there was a whole generation <laughs> yeah. who were just traumatised by it. Extremely traumatised, yeah. And I think we're, we're all looking for some sort of expression of it, almost like, like an exorcism. It's like a group therapy session, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah. I, I only noticed recently, I looked at the video and I was like, what the, what the hell's going on there? <laughs> it's people... It's, yeah, it's... it's, it's... Of all the videos, I guess it makes sense. It does make sense. It does for, make for that sense. One. It really does in a very perverse way. It makes a great deal of sense. But tonight we're, we're not talking about when the wind blows. And nothing quite as traumatic, but something that does sort of go to some emotional depth. So we're, we're going to be discussing... Uh, the the new Shira cartoon, the Netflix Shira cartoon. Um, but how did you? I mean, how did you come to this, Laura? It was a friend of mine, um, a, a Finnish friend, Maritz, uh, who I generally trust her taste in yeah. cartoons and in TV shows. And she said, yeah, yeah, this is this is really really good, and you have to watch it. So, uh -huh. and I look at it thinking, oh, Shira. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, I wasn't super into it when I was young. I was more, uh -huh. I was more of a He-Man yeah, uh, fan. Yeah. So I always gravitated towards stuff that was, you know, in inverted commas, four boys. Four boys, yes. And Shira felt like, oh, it's like He-Man, but they've tried to make it girly and that's um, kind I'm just of what they did as well, isn't it, with the original? Yeah. I mean, you look at the origins of the original show and it's like it's very haphazard and very boardroom you know it's it's a case oh, sure. of oh you know we need to have something to market this toy range so we'll just say we're going to make a cartoon and then we'll produce it as cheaply as possible oh yeah. we need we, we we need to corner the market on the girls toy so let's just make a a girls version of he-man yeah and we'll just cobble together some nonsensical story about it being his uh, you know he-man's sister and yeah. oh, it's it, it's it's in the same universe but nothing's the same yeah. you know it's just it's adjacent it's fine we'll just yeah. roll with it it's in, in its own peculiar way there is a there is a degree of very sort of sinister marketing genius going on with it i mean because it has stuck i mean things like she yeah. and he-man they have stuck people still remember them people still have enormous fondness for them to the point whereby i mean she kind of died a death and we just went away for a while but he-man has stuck around i mean there have been multiple versions of He-Man. There was a, a really awful uh, 1990s cartoon called The New Adventures of He-Man, which just doesn't even bear mentioning. It, it was just terrible. Um, and then there was one in 2002 as well, which was actually loads of fun. Really I missed well produced. Both of those. Oh well, the, I wouldn't bother going and watching the new adventures <laughs> of He Man. It's just tat. It really is. It, it's just. <laughs> it doesn't even have like all of the stuff that makes like the original He Man laudable. You know, the silly campery, the awful animation, the all of that stuff that's really fun to adult eyes to see. <laughs> it just isn't there. Yeah. In the new adventures of He Man, it's is just. It's just how. Sorry, go on. It, re no, just say, it's interesting how some some reboots or you know modern takes on things work much better than others. As you say, mm. the campery was kind of one of my enduring memories of He-Man because I remember you know I really liked He-Man as a kid and my brother was terrified of it for reasons I cannot <laughs> fathom and never could fathom. But he was really scared of He-Man. Right. Okay. And I remember, yeah, genuinely like the, the theme tune would play and he'd ah, and he'd run out of the room. Right, he was terrified. Okay. That's no idea. <laughs> no idea why he was scared of it. Um, he was scared of everything, though. Ah. Um, I remember talking about it sort of in class, in secondary school, and my 
my secondary school teacher pointing out just how enormously camp it was. You've got this guy in a loincloth riding around on a tiger with a sword. Yeah. It's all, you know, terrifically camp. Oh, the, 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 there's a bizarre... I don't, I don't know. It must have been unintentional. I cannot think that it was intentional, but there is this bizarre queer coding to He-Man. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, it couldn't have been intentional, could it? I mean, it, in, nowadays you might think, oh, they've done yeah. that on purpose, but I'm sure they, maybe they sort of didn't realise what they were leaning into. <laughs> but <laughs> it is so leaning into it. <laughs> powerfully mm. queer coded. That's, that's, very, what, very that's what is so strange about it. I could, I could understand someone who comes to the original show and thinks, oh, there is some, there is something. I mean, she even more so. I mean, yeah. if you watch oh, yeah, oh, yeah. the original she cartoon, I mean, you've got the, the character Bo in the original she cartoon, and he is, he looks for all the world like he's just stepped off of a gay pride parade. <laughs> he really does. You know, his, his bared midriff, his, like, the heart shape cut into his, his chest, yeah. you know, his I little moustache. Look, I looked back at all the old designs shortly after I uh, I started watching the, the new series because oh. I couldn't really remember a lot. And I look back at now and I was like, yeah, how? Like, I, I guess nowadays queer is more mainstream, right? And you Absolutely. can't, you know, because of, because of the internet, queer culture is a thing that you can't necessarily miss. But I guess in the 80s, it was queer culture was much more subculture, I think. Yeah, and sublimated, perhaps, mm. you know, maybe so think... it was expressing itself in these very unusual ways, you know, yeah. almost unconscious ways. I think you could very easy, le- easily lean into queer coding without knowing that that's what you were doing. That's you what were you just were taking, doing. <laughs> yeah, you were just taking aesthetics and you know certain a certain type of aesthetic from places that maybe you saw you've seen it somewhere in passing, or maybe mm-hmm. you've seen it in something else. You don't actually get what it's coding and what the significance of that coding is. You just think, oh, that's an interesting aesthetic. I'll borrow that. Yeah, yeah. And that's where you end up is one of the gayest cartoons in the 80s. It's ever. And it's ironic, isn't it? (laughs) You know, like ever, yeah? It's ironic given that He-Man was initially designed to be so Conan-like, you know, to be so hyper-masculine in many respects in the worst possible ways. (laughs) And it turns into this massive queer icon, which it is. It's huge. I mean, He-Man has an enormous gay following. And completely understandably. I mean, understandably, I, I, this is why yeah. I found it interesting when... Uh, so the other reason that I got into the she cartoon was because shortly after my friend recommended it, hmm. I noticed a lot of internet faffing and hoo-ha oh, about the redesign. Yeah. And, you know, there was a lot of she not sexy anymore and yeah. they all look like lesbians and all this sort of thing. And I thought... And it was it was that they all look like lesbians, but that... <sighs> I was interested in because, again, I just and also all, all the in, in she rather the new she rather is obvious queer coding, intentional oh queer coding, which God, I think what, is oh. wonderful. Well, this show, I mean, one of the things that completely surprised me about it is how sincerely queer coded the whole show is. Yeah. But in the best possible way, it's not queer coded in the same way as like a lot of sort of slightly comic booky or fantasy mythologies are, where mm. it's negative queer coding. You know, very often the villain is the queer mm. character and it's it, they they sort of represent lots of very negative queer stereotypes not mm. so here absolutely and i think the other thing is and i, I probably I, I guess there's probably a lot of people can sympathize with this but i've always been for a long time now been quite hungry for for content which features queer characters mm. but just as characters so what yeah. i mean by that is where the queerness is not an issue yeah and it's not something that needs to be worked through it's not a uh sort of the defining characteristic of the characters it's just there it's yeah. in the background it's part of everyday life and that i didn't actually realize until quite a few episodes in that spinnerella and um i can't remember her name now oh and yeah. Natosa yeah. were a couple oh yeah i didn't no, the two kind of yeah, the two the two more of the more useless uh, princesses. But no, it didn't occur to me. It's and it wasn't until later it? on that I was like, oh, they're 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 a couple because yeah. it's just so organic and so natural. And that's this is why I always laugh at people who say, oh, you know, things are shoehorned in because it's mm. it's the opposite of shoehorned in. It's just part of the fabric of that world, it like is. it is in 
in real life and it's i i really loved that about it yeah i mean i i came to i mean like yourself i wasn't really that bothered about he-man or she-ra that much when i was a kid i knew they were around you know they were it's hard it was hard to be a child of the 80s and not know that he-man was around really yeah and like you know it's the kind of thing where i had a couple of vhs tapes of some of the cartoons and i maybe had some of the action figures at some time but it wasn't really a big thing um I've been aware of it throughout the years and of the 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 different incarnations of it. Really love the 2002 cartoon because that is very very good indeed. Has all the sort of campery of the original show but marries it to a kind of anime action aesthetic so everything's quite mm -hmm. dynamic and fun and the bad guys are really threatening instead of being really campy which I really like. Um but this, when it when it cropped up, when it started to sort of make waves, I became intrigued because I was just... The notion of having She-Ra in and of itself, not as an adjunct to a He-Man cartoon, not as a lead-in to a He-Man cartoon, but as its own entity, mm. I found to be fascinating. I, I thought that was really a really cool idea. And then, as you mentioned, you started to get all of the hoo-ha, all of the the, the silly sort of uh, reactionary stuff cropping up about it. You know, oh, they, it's, um, it, 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 they all look like lesbians, and it, the, the animation is all wrong. Oh, she or I isn't sexy enough, uh, or whatever nonsense. And that made me want to watch it more. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. I had, had exactly the same effect on me as well because I thought, well, it's upsetting all the people that I like to upset. So exactly. clearly, clearly, this is yeah relevant it's, to my interest. It's got to have something worthy in it, doesn't it? It's got to have something yeah. worthy in it. If it's upsetting all the right people, it's got to yeah. have something good in it. But man, I from like the first few episodes, I was impressed. Yeah, I was really impressed. This. This cartoon is so beautifully written. It is, it is. And the, I mean, I think what drew, drew me in initially before I really... Because obviously, you know, as with all shows, the first few episodes is scene setting and it's yeah. um, getting to know the characters. And it's that's where a show can kind of hook or lose you. Yeah. And it, what I think she does very well is that in the first few episodes, it's not necessarily the story or any of the those features that, that draws you in, but it's just the sheer power of the dialogue and yeah. the, the the sense of fun because it's it's clear it's a, a sense of humor that you don't often get in kids shows it's uh -huh. you know very, almost, almost python-esque in places you know yeah. it's, it's sort of a little bit surreal a little bit ridic ridiculous but just good fun yeah which the, I, there's a kind of irreverent humor in yeah it, irreverent there? is the word i'm searching for yeah definitely it kind of pokes fun at itself and at its own universe and at its own foibles. And th there are these wonderful asides into almost surrealism. Yeah, there's the surrealist parts that I really enjoyed. And um, yeah, it's very in, in those first few episodes, it's very conscious of what kind of show it is. And it yeah. and it what I liked and I, I only really saw this on a rewatch because by the time I'd got around to it, I'd sort of forgotten the first few episodes. <laughs> so I went back to see them and it, it dismantles a lot of what you expect um, and I really like the way it does that because yep. obviously you are supposed to, you know, you've got the good guys and the bad guys, yeah. right? That's that's how they show. Not so much, though. You know, you no. have the good guys and you have the bad Sometimes do bad things. And the bad guys are actually just kind of They're trying to kind get by. People, aren't they? They're all, yeah. they're just, I mean, one of the things that impressed me about the early episodes is the close focus on the ostensible bad guys. I mean, yeah. a lot of it is set in the Fright Zone with the Horde and with the, the people who make up the Horde. Because, of course, Adora, uh, who becomes she is part of the Horde to begin with. Yeah. And they're not bad people. None of them are, really. They're just doing what they think is correct. They're doing what they think is right. I mean, you're introduced to the, you know, those three comic foible characters, Cody and his lot, the yeah. lizard guy and, and whatnot. And oh, yeah. they're clearly uh, not terrible people. No, and actually, they're not even particularly competent people. No. They're sort of just, tr they're just kids that are trying their best. That's the other thing. You kind of realise that they are almost all 
just kids. They're just kids. That's you know, another thing I yeah. love about the show, actually. You've got this weird thing going on where the focus is all on the children. It's all on sort of like the latter generations. They're the ones that are moving everything forward. And when yeah. you get the adult characters, there's almost like a Roll Dahl thing going on where the adult characters are either sinister, like Shadow Weaver and Hordak, who are basically mother and father, aren't they? They're yeah. sort of like wicked stepmother and wicked stepfather. Uh, or they're impotent. Yeah. You know, they're impotent like the, the, the mothers and fathers of the princesses who are, they're not even fighting a rebellion anymore. They've retreated from it. They've, they've, they don't see any point in it. They've been too battered down. They've been too disappointed. So it's left to the rebellious children to do something yeah. about it, to shake them into action. I loved that dynamic. Yeah, putting the, all the power is in the hands of the children. And this is something that they develop along the way because, of course, you know, of, you know, this, here there be spoilers for anybody who hasn't oh, watched it, totally, but I'm going to just yeah. dive we're, straight we're in. Gonna, we're going to go deep, deep, deep <laughs> into spoilers, so go watch it. Yeah? This, is, this, is your, this is your last warning. Uh -huh. but, um, <laughs> so even with somebody like Shadow Weaver, so Shadow Weaver in the first series, second series, is like this deeply, deeply sinister, mm. kind of almost like abusive mother figure. You know, yep. she's awful. You know, you see the way that she In the worst way. Like, yeah, she's They legit, really do like... Awful. If if I don't like if you've ever known someone who is like an abusive parent or a manipulative parent, she echoes them like mm. so sincerely. I could see it being like quite affecting for people, you know, who have been yeah, through sure. that or who have experienced that themselves. Because she she has every quality of the manipulative, abusive mother. Yeah, yeah, she really, really does, and you can see, you know, th th then you have you have sympathy for someone like Catra, who, mm. you know, the, 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 so this is this is this is the interesting thing though. This is sort of how what I'm leading up to is the idea that the people who in the beginning are the hugely sinister and and awful figures like Shadow Weaver, mm. like Hordak, as time goes on, they lose yeah. their power. You know, they become more and more impotent. The, yeah. the, the adult the adult antagonists. Um, are sort of revealed to be very hollow. Yeah, I mean, that, that's Aren't another thing. It's so clever. It is so clever because in all previous editions, characters like, like Hordak, for example, in, in the original She-Ra cartoon, Hordak is kind of like your doofy villain. He's a bit like Skeletor. He's just Skeletor, basically. He's just another basically. version of Skeletor that snarls <laughs> a lot and snorts a lot. But there is a tendency in the latter day stuff, like the 2002 cartoon, to paint him as like this almost like Sauron like evil, you know, like the ultimate force of negativity. He is the big bad and mm. there's nothing else to him. He's no. just an evil dude. And the way he's presented in this cartoon, yeah, you would probably think that for a little while. Yeah, in the first series, maybe even throughout the second series, mm -hmm. you get this idea of him being this powerful force of evil yeah and then entractor comes along yeah then <laughs> and um, you the start dynamic to see you, you there are these wonderful little moments where hordak is humanized yeah where you get to see and you that... realize that he's actually yeah that he you know physically vulnerable obviously uh -huh. but also you know that he is not the sort of two-dimensional evil thing that you not at all yeah he's not and the, the same he's with not shadow the mega you know, he's no, not he's mega not. baddie. He is this broken guy who, like yeah. almost every character in the show, is seeking something. They want some sort of emotional fulfillment, um, often from a sort of absent father or, or, or parent figure. Mm. It's brilliant. It is. Ap I think I thought the humanizing of Hordak and the giving him some motivation beyond "Oh, I'm so evil, I am, and I just want to conquer everything." Yeah, brilliant. Because uh, the reason he's doing it, I mean, that's what I love. The reason he's trying to conquer Etheria is to show his his absent sibling, his creator, essentially, yeah. that he's worthy, that he's not this this failed experiment. You know. Yeah. And you know when you see him outside of his armor for the first time. Yeah, and yeah. You, you get, you realise that this guy who is presented as like, oh, he's so powerful. Oh, this is the the dark lord of the evil forces. Is this vulnerable, skeletal, broken down thing? Yeah, he's barely holding on at all. Yeah. You know, he's. And then when you you realise his backstory that he is this kind of clone that is degrading very, very quickly. Um. 
Yeah, you had the same thing I said with Shadow Weaver early on as well, when you realise that Shadow Weaver is, you know, that Shadow Weaver is, is, is also in many ways a failure as well. Yeah, she yeah. she reached too far and failed, and, and, and it, there were consequences for it, and her consequences were banishment. And yeah. she's sought to regain that power and then loses it once again. And it's, you know, obviously, then you get this whole story about whose side is she on? Is she mm. helping or hindering? You can never, you can never truly the trust Shadow her. Weaver, you can never tell, can you? Because she is no. such a manipulator. But it does look like, doesn't it? Like in season four in particular, it looks like she's on the level. I, I had a lot of sympathy for Glimmer in season four, even though mm-hmm. Glimmer made some, you know, unquestionably bad choices. Yeah. I do think that reaching out to Shadow Weaver and who, who you know, trained her father mm. as of well, course. let's not forget. And now this is Glimmer who has grown up without a father and now has neither father nor mother. Yeah. Or, well, anyway, we think at, at that point she has neither father nor mother. Mm. Um, and so she's reaching out to somebody who is not only offering this sensible kind of parent figure, Mm-hmm. Which, which is a red, you know, obviously is a red flag yeah. at first because we know what Shadow Weaver does with that, but it really genuinely does look like Shadow Weaver is just trying to help Glimmer, yeah, um, reach her best because at the very end when Glimmer is about to make a terrible mistake, even Shadow Weaver tells her to stop. Yeah, absolutely. It looks like um, because of course Adora doesn't trust Shadow Weaver as far as, no. she, as she could kick her because she and you is, can't blame her. No, I mean she is the abused stepdaughter, isn't she? Yeah. So she's not going to trust Shadow Weaver. But it does look like the Shadow Weaver was trying to do her best for Glimmer, albeit perhaps um, in an ill-advised way. And that's that's another thing that's brilliant about the show. The characters are characters. They're not archetypes. They're not yeah. toys that need to be sold, or so they just need to turn up regardless. They're all complex and interesting characters, even the villains. And it's it's amazing for a show that is ostensibly aimed at children, although it is the kind of show that anyone can watch and get something out of is this complex yeah i think we've spoken before about um how the best children shows are shows that don't speak down to children and kind of yeah. recognize their inherent ability to understand and that's why you can watch it as a child or as an adult and find value in it you know the the, the whole kind of idea that people are shades of gray is really mm-hmm. uh, you know it's, it's it is fantastic because at every point you see people doing good and bad. You know, yeah. you, every single character has had a moment where they've done something against their type. You yeah. know, if they're a good guy, they've done something stupid or ill-advised or downright Even, like malicious. Bad. Yeah, sometimes or malicious, they've, they've yeah. been a little bit malicious, particularly in season four. I mean, there are points where the the relationship between Glimmer and Adora gets pretty unpleasant. Very much so. And that, that's quite hard to watch as well. If you've, if you've ever had a kind of friendship like that, where mm-hmm. the power, you know, you're used to the power being balanced in a certain way and then yeah. that changes and you can no longer relate to one another in the way that you previously did. Yeah. And and I can, and I can empathise with both of them in that situation because although Glimmer is making rash decisions and making bad choices, uh, at the same time, you know, you see the way that she that she is treated and the way that people do regard her and you know yeah she is kind of left out and kind of and she is you know ultimately there is the you know she is the queen isn't she she? at this point she is technically in charge but because adora it's exactly what you were talking about it it is the power balance isn't it because adora has been used to being shira the kind of prophesied saint of this movement she just acts without any without reference to glimmer a lot of the time even though she's often correct even though she's often right she she doesn't really regard glimmer yeah. um and it does show there is a kind of it's it's so clever because the show actually demonstrates that even though they do care for one another even though there is a sort there is this kind of sisterly friendship going on there are problems here yeah this is a complex and problematic relationship and in the middle you've got Bo, of course god bless, god bless Bo. yeah, yeah. The... Like Bo, who who you know is always been the glue that holds them together but you realize in season four just how ineffective Bo actually is because yeah. he's so wishy-washy and he's mm-hmm. so he doesn't he's just not helpful in any way shape or form really well, when I... it comes down to it because he doesn't know you know, I think he he starts to develop mm-hmm. that kind of backbone that he needs. But obviously, yeah. this is all foreshadowed. You see the episode of Bo uh, with his with his dad, and you realise yes. that he's been living this lie because he's been too afraid to yeah. to 
state what he wants and clearly this is something that dogs bow throughout because he's still doing it yeah you know, he's, still... he's um he's afraid of conflict isn't he yes he's very clearly very conflict avoidant and this is you know causing major major issues i mean I, the thing one of the things i do love about the the dynamic you have between adora bow and glimmer throughout is it would have been so tempting to go down the easy and well-trodden path and develop some sort of romantic subplot for one or all three of them mm. and, but it doesn't happen yeah. And I love that. Bo's position amongst... Because Bo's really interesting because he is the almost like the token male figure in this pantheon of princesses. Yep. And also one of the... Perhaps the, the emotional kind of centre. Yeah. Yeah, it's... It's it, it's one of the things the show does very cleverly and very subtly. It just subverts almost every stereotype or every tradition of this kind of cartoon. So my favourite character, well, I have a few favourite characters. One of my favourite characters is Seahawk. Yeah, I love I Seahawk. Love Seahawk. I love and Seahawk, Seahawk is, he's the ultimate <laughs> deconstruction of the, you know, the, the swashbuckling pirate hero because yeah. he's, he's crap. Well, he's a bullshitter, isn't he? He's, yeah, he's, he's a he's, complete he's, liar, you know? <laughs> he's, a, he's a total liar. He's, well, he's not he's useless, he's harsh. He's not useless, he does no. have uses. But his uses are not what he thinks they are. No, and, he is you not know, you, any, some kind of, like, swashbuckling adventurer. He is not no and there's this really wonderful moment where you know and again with the male vulnerability where he sits mm. down with um with scorpia yeah and they have this heart to heart about you know scorpia obviously very you know pushed aside by catra mm -hmm. and you know if you've got this and we'll talk i'll talk about this in, in, in a minute but that wonderful kind of quite clearly queer i thought was a really really well handled yeah but then you've got um seahawk who just doesn't get why people don't think he's cool anymore i set my <laughs> ship on fire isn't that cool people used to love that you know he's just <laughs> he's just so likable because yeah, he's seahawk, so useless whenever he turned up it was a good episode basically I, it was a good time i love the episode where he tries to make everyone feel better by taking them out on the town and then arranging a kidnapping that goes wrong <laughs> to an actual kidnapping <laughs> you know he can't even do that right he's well, just that's a great he's, he's, episode because you've got like you've got episode. you've got seahawk doing his shtick which is great but that's also the episode where Bo starts to realize a little bit about himself and about his dynamic between yeah. adora and glimmer and the fact that i mean it's a harsh lesson really but he's kind of not that important no but yeah, and that's it's interesting seeing Bo come to terms with that, isn't it? Yeah, it really is because he doesn't get bitter about it. He doesn't get unpleasant about it. He resolves to basically make himself more worthy. Yeah, which is great. I mean, it's a complex, harsh lesson, and it's not overstated either. That's another thing the show does really well. It doesn't it doesn't make things over. You know, again, which you know, obviously the original shows they used to have those canned morals at the end of every single episode. Which yeah. were, were just bizarre. Often they just had no relevance to what was happening in the actual show. They were just like, oh, we need... What can we have as a moral today? Don't oh, talk to strangers. Are there any strangers in the show? No, just no. put it in there anyway. Whatever. Don't don't put the cat in the dishwasher or whatever. Just, just put something <laughs> like that, you know. Don't drink out of the toilet or whatever. Um, but here, this show, it integrates whatever message it has into the story and into the character dynamics, which as good stories do. And it doesn't have the characters standing around, like, looking at the screen, telling the children because they're idiots, you know? Yeah, again, it's it's just it's trusting children with their own intelligence. And, yeah. you know, when we talked earlier about how it's great to have queer characters that aren't, you know, issue-based, mm. it's the same with the, any kind of moral or lesson that the show be imbued with it's it's all relevant to the story it's all told through the story and it's all stuff to be gleaned from the story like it's never punching you in the face with a moral or punching you in the face with it with anything you know even even when you get something like bo's dads you mm -hmm. know it's just oh that's bo's dad yeah. you know there's that's it it's that's just it it is yeah. not in fact the issue there is something totally 
totally beyond like the fact that he has two dads that's not uh, an issue in this culture or in this world yeah the issue is th- that he feels as though he's letting them down somehow that he can't be himself around them uh, and that's brilliant i mean it's absolutely brilliant it 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 not only sort of normalizes the relationship which is fantastic and the dynamic but it also it's it establishes that there are just more important factors to this kind of family dynamic you know there are other tensions that need to be addressed and it's just it's wonderful to see a world where it isn't an issue you know where it is just such such a normal thing it doesn't even pass comment no you know no one's like oh he's got two dads it's just oh that's both parents you know and nobody comments yeah it's obviously such a a normal situation that it doesn't it's not even worth pointing out. It's no, just, I think they're just excited to meet them, well. aren't they? They're just like, oh <laughs> yeah. my god, we didn't even know that Bo had parents. You know, we, we well, you don't at that point, do you? You're just like, oh, but what, what is his deal? You know, he just yeah. kind of hangs around. Does he, you know, does he have a life outside Where did of this? He, yeah, it's a fair point. Where did he come from? Because of course, the the whole thing with the resistance is that they are the princesses. They are these almost like. I don't know, they're almost like little demigods, aren't they? Or, or little yeah. elementals that have these powers over nature and whatnot. So where did Bo come from? He just kind of appeared. Like, you know, he, he, that's what I like about characters like him and Seahawk is they're just mm-hmm. there. Like, you know, the princesses obviously have got these kind of significant backstories and mm-hmm. these significant points. But then you get people who just exist in the world, yeah. like like Bo and like Seahawk and like, you know... There's, there's a few other characters like that. They're just there. They're just they're there. Just there. Yeah. And, and that's I, fine. <laughs> it's cool, isn't it? It's really cool. It just lends flavour. It lends a little bit of dynamism to things. And I, I mean, did, the episode where Seahawk first turns up, and initially, sort of people sort of believe his spiel, especially <laughs> Bo. Yeah. Bo is, like, so taken in by him, and there is real, sort of like, um, not necessarily a homosexual attra- attraction between them, but like a homoromantic thing going on. Yeah, for sure, yeah. It's it's like, well, I guess the word you, that people use is bromance, isn't it? It's a it? bromance, that, isn't it? It's yeah, a yeah. bromance. And that carries on as well, you know, and it's just, you know, that's nice too, that there's... Uh, a way of the kind of the male bonding that happens. I mean, you have the whole episode which is male bonding, don't you? Which is great. <laughs> it's just the, and the, it's... the friends is friends episode. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but it's um, but you know, you often get. I, I find that the, the male characters actually are often the most em- emotionally intelligent characters on the show as well which i find really interesting and refreshing. Yeah, um, it's not something you often get, is it? No, it's not. Like Bo is very, you know, all of his failings he's is extremely emotionally intelligent extremely mm. astute he might not know what to do with that knowledge yeah. but he's his knowledge is very you know and and actually to be fair to seahawk he he him too he he's very aware of and that's part of the reason that he acts the way that he does because he's very uh conscious that people don't react to him the way that they they should in theory react to a cool pirate who yeah. sets his ship on <laughs> fire and you know fights <laughs> fights monsters and you know <laughs> But he's but also. Favorite... Sorry, go on. No, I was just gonna say my favourite joke in that is when they co- they meet him again and he's he's lost his ship and they say, oh, "What happened to your ship?" And you expect it, you're waiting for it. And he goes, yeah. oh, "It was termites." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brilliant, brilliant. I mean, that's another thing. The characters are so well developed and establish themselves so quickly that you can have the those character based jokes, and it works really, really well. Yeah, yeah, he's. <laughs> I, I mean, and the, the other, my other favorite, t- two favorite characters, and they're very similar to Seahawk in a lot of ways. I, I loved Scorpia. Oh, Absolutely I mean, Scorpia, Scorpia. has got her own massive fan base. Off the I'm back not of this. surprised. You know, I remember having this conversation with somebody about Scorpia, and they were saying that basically she kind of, you know, how when you get sort of lesbian subculture, and the idea is that you should be butch or you should be mm-hmm. femme, right? That's yep. the two. And Scorpia is kind of like sticking two fingers up to both because she's, totally. you know, on on the surface you'd think, oh, she's she's totally butch, but actually, you know, then you, you know she wears these amazing evening gowns, mm-hmm. and she's so actually, you know. She might look butch, but she's so femme. She is so femme, isn't she? She's so yeah, she is like the emotional centre, isn't she? And she's she also really is. she's the leavening agent on the sort of bad guy side, isn't she? She is the heart of that yes. particular team. Uh, but people love her. 
They love her to bits. And isn't it, it's so cool. I'm, I'm in awe at how they've taken these characters who were kind of nobody in the original cartoon. You know, they were, they were background henchmen for Hordak. They were no one. They turned up and they were just like, you know, it was someone on the animation team who said, oh, we haven't put this toy in for a while. Let's put this one in. Um, and they've turned them into characters. Yeah. Like real, proper, deep, interesting characters. And Scorpia, she, she's got so much going on. She could so easily have just been the comic foil. Oh, yeah. She could have just been the, the you know, the, the, the dorky, socially inept, yeah. uh, you know, force captain who's not very good. Yeah. Obviously has a crush on Catra. Crushing and very hard good that on either. Catra. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. You know, endlessly rebuffed. She could have just been a joke. Yeah. But actually, they turn her into something not only really complex, but also significant, like mythologically significant at the end. Well, crucial. She is she's the crux of that that last episode. Without yeah. her power, they, you know, rightly or wrongly, they cannot access. But she has to be involved. She has to yeah. have, you know, you can't write her off because and this is so this is something else that I regard. And I've, I've, funny enough, I've spoken about this before on the show as yeah. well, about how much I hate the chosen one narrative. Right. Yeah. Can't stand the chosen one narrative. Mm-hmm. When I first started watching Go, I was a little bit on the fence about that as well, because yeah. obviously initially I'm like, oh, you know, it's another chosen one thing. She rather mm-hmm. Prince of Power, you know, all this sort of thing. And then you cut quickly quite quickly but gradually the chosen one thing sucks yeah it's terrible to be the chosen one mm-hmm. you get that really cool episode where she was trying to argue with light hope yeah and light hope's basically like tough shit this is this is it this is your destiny yeah you don't get to choose you Whereas know and Dora just, is like no i'm more than that you know yeah. i am not this cut out template i'm not part of this machine i mean the show even has the sheer brass tacks to completely obliterate the chosen one narrative and to to take the the classic mythology oh the sword the magic the power of gray skull all of that nonsense and to say actually it's negative yeah. It's corrosive. It's yeah. something that will destroy the world if it's not stopped. You know, and, and nearly and nearly did the first time round. Yeah. You know, the whole having having Mara who realised as well that being the chosen one was actually a terrible thing to be. That's a ballsy um, move for this. I, loved I mean, it. yeah, me too. I thought it was so clever because that is it's doing what. It's doing what sort of like the, the latter day Star Wars films are doing, where they are taking the, the beloved mythology and they are completely turning it on its head. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was the moment that I really fell in love with the show. There were, there were lots of things that made me fall in love with it. But when I realised it was it was completely just disregarding the tradition of yeah. the chosen one. And in, 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 and in that bolder fashion as well, not just yeah. disregarding it, but saying, you know, actually, it's garbage. It's negative, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's actually a corrosive and, in this yeah. case, apocalyptic thing. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that all the characters have spent all this time kind of thinking it's such a beautiful thing and thinking yeah. that we're going to save the world because of it. You know, for them to, at that last moment, turn around and say, actually, no, every, no. you know, it's you're being manipulated the chosen mm. one is yeah somebody chose the chosen one exactly because you know, that's, yeah. that's always the question isn't it who who chooses yeah, who says yeah who, where exactly. is this written and who determines this yeah That's exactly funny. so she-ra in this particular show is not some great savior or great hope in fact it it reduces her so powerfully it turns her into a component in a machine yeah it does that's it that's all she is she is just the focal point for this bizarre metaphysical engine that's going to reshape all of reality and i love the fact that the tension comes down to it's between the personal and the mythological how much of herself does she want to retain and how much does she want to be this this mythological prescribed entity you know that's an awesome yeah. tension it actually, especially sorry go on no, no, I was just going to say, especially given her origins as well, because, yeah. you know, of course, she already was a cog in a machine in the beginning, and you think of that she's course. getting away from that. Yeah. And oh, actually, that... she's just repeating the same the same routine in a different in a yeah. different place. God, that's br- that is quite brilliant, isn't it? For for ostensibly a bit of children's media to be that complex, to say to kids like, you may even think that you found a place, or that you found a purpose, but you need to be aware. Yeah. 
you need to be conscious of the fact that it may be something that's being imposed on you that you may not want. It's, I think it's playing with the idea of what freedom actually is, because, yeah. you know, Shira, Adora has never been free. And yeah. I think well, well, what's interesting about where series four leaves off is that this is the first time that you could argue that she, you know, potentially is free now. Yeah. She we just don't know how that freedom's going to manifest. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's, it is a Agency, brilliant... that's the right yeah, word, yeah. It is, isn't yeah. it? She has some agency outside of being told that, oh, she is this, she, she, uh, she's a force captain in the Horde, she is this chosen prophetess of the Rebellion. Uh, she is this otherworldly entity yeah. that has a prescribed destiny. Um, and it's, it's a ballsy move to dare to say, nah, she, that, all of that, all of that is actually just imposition. And that she is yeah. herself. She is her own self. And the core of the show, the focus, is not about all of this mythological stuff. It's about the relationships. Yeah. Because that, arguably, oh. at, at that very last few episodes, if the relationship between herself and Glimmer hadn't broken down, mm -hmm. things would have worked out very, very differently. Yeah. But because there is this power struggle and there is this kind of... Because I think the other thing that it is questioning is power, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's questioning who has power and is there a way that you can wield power responsibly? Yeah. You know, and clearly it's, you know, the, the, the power that Glimmer has as queen, it, she wields it irresponsibly in, mm -hmm. in the end. She is wielding her power irresponsibly. Everybody yeah. who has power is wielding it without wielding it. You know, they're not wielding it responsibly. And that's, it, can it be wielded? wielded mm -hmm. responsibly? We just, I, I, from what we can see, it almost seems like it, the answer is no. It almost seems like the answer is no. It really does. What it, Excuse me, what it seems to say is we are all prey to our neuroses, mm. regardless of who we are. We are all sort of byproducts of our circumstances. And so we can't, we can't necessarily wield power, certainly not of this scale, with any degree of responsibility. You've got Hordak, who is ostensibly very authoritative and powerful but is prey to his daddy issues. You know, he wants mm -hmm. to impress his sibling uh, slash father figure. Uh, you, I mean, Catra, bloody mm. hell, Catra <laughs> where is... Where do you begin the Catra? <laughs> where do you even begin? I mean, she is my favourite character in the whole thing. She's amazing, yeah. Because she is... And again, is... she's kind of ascended as well from her original form, hasn't she, Catra? Oh, big, wow. Big style. What, what I love is the fact that the, the show very subtly and very naturally supplants Hordak as the main villain. Yeah. It focuses on Catra because the whole thing, really right up until the end of season three, and arguably even through season four, the whole thing hinges on this massively fraught, complex relationship Catra has with Adora. Yeah. I mean, what is it? What are they to one another? I don't think even Catra knows. No, I don't. But I think you, you can see whenever Catra begins to kind of interrogate it, she shuts that down. Yeah, she's too afraid to even think about what, you know, because obviously her they, they were friends and then she felt abandoned. Yeah, and that's and that's the start of it. And then it's this kind of. I wish she was always better than me. I was never, you know, right. I was never good enough. But then even that isn't the answer, is it? No. Because every time she thinks you think she's pinned down the reasoning, something else comes up. Yeah. So. You know, I I wonder if we I I assume we probably will get to the bottom of it at some point, but I I don't think Catra even knows. I don't think she does. I think it's a source of sincere frustration to her, and probably the source of the antagonism itself. Why she can't really see what they are to one another? Yeah. Because of course they've never been allowed to develop a real natural relationship. They were no. forced together as children, as part of the horde. They were conditioned together. So. Again, it's what you were talking about earlier. It's this power dynamic. It's yeah. this power dynamic. And of course, now, because Adora became She-Ra, the power dynamic changed dramatically. And Catra seems to have taken on all of that trauma, all of that abuse, and turned it into bitterness. I mean, at the end of season three, her bitterness destroys the world. Yeah, literally. <laughs> it shows you how far she's willing to go. Yeah, and it's interesting because, you know, you can make an argument for the reason that Adora avoided that kind of uh, that kind of same fate is because she was exposed to what relationships outside of that very narrow frame were. You know, yeah. when she leaves the Horde and she meets Bo and Glimmer and all of the others. Mm -hmm. 
And that very nearly happens for Catra with Scorpia. Almost, and, but she won't let it, will but she? she? But Catra, there is, there is that point where Scorpia leaves. And mm-hmm. you, I, I, it's, I'm going to write fan fiction about this at some point because I can't <laughs> stop thinking about it. But that, it's almost like a sliding doors moment, isn't it? What yeah. would have happened if she'd looked for Scorpia and she'd found Scorpia? What yeah. would, have, would something have changed? Because she, I think something clicked for Catra then. Yeah. But the the only reason she never was never able to follow up on it is because Scorpio wasn't there, which is not Scorpio's fault at all, no. by the way. Scorpio did absolutely the right thing. Oh the... yeah, leaving that relationship was the best yeah. thing she ever did, and really surprising, you know, because like it would have been again the easy answer just to have her maintained at that point, always suspended in the same place, you know. Mm. And they don't do that. Yeah. They have her change. They have her realise. And I loved that moment where, you know, that you're a bad friend. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. It's such a simple it's such a simple line, isn't it? it, it but coming, coming from Scorpio, who has never said a bad thing about anybody in her life. And certainly not about Let Catra. Let alone Catra. Oh, yeah. She worships exactly. the ground she walks on. She makes... Yeah. I love the way all the way through the show, and it's played for laughs, but it is also kind of neurotic. You, she mm. is excusing and justifying everything Catra does. Yeah, Every even abuse. down to you know betraying Entrapta, who yeah. she also clearly cares very much for Entrapta as well, mm-hmm. but not as much as she cares for Catra. Yeah. So, so Entrapta becomes collateral damage. Yeah. And it's that's a sad moment as well because you look at the way that Scorpio and Cat, um, Scorpio and Entrapta interact, and you think, you know, this is a friendship that actually could have worked. Yeah. With Scorpio, you know, this is this is a, this could have been a real friendship, but it, it isn't because she's so blind. Yeah. And because she's so blind, she allows Cat to do what she does. Yeah, I mean, it is a genuinely abusive relationship. It to, is to the point where it's not just emotionally abusive and manipulative; it's actually physically abusive at various points. Yeah, definitely. Again, really cool lesson to give to kids. You know, it's a really brilliant way of showing them how abusive relationships actually operate. Yeah, and 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 the the fact that Catra, you know, is smaller. You know, the the, 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 the physical differential between them. You know, the, that's not a factor. You know, that's an interesting thing as well because yeah. you would, you know, you would normally could equate abuse with strength, wouldn't you? Of but, course. You know, strength is not. I think it's important to teach kids that abuse isn't always about physicality. Sometimes it's about, you know, strength of personality and, man- yeah. and, and manipulativeness, because that's what Catcher excels in, isn't it, is manipulativeness. Absolutely. Absolutely. the very end. And one thing I really loved, actually, with, with a lesson that Catcher learned is when Catcher is out manipulated by Double Trouble. Yeah. Which is a great Ooh. moment. And it's, it's, the, it's the way Double Trouble operates as well, the way they... They make Catra face herself, yes. see herself for everything she is. Because, of course, that's, that's well. Double Trouble's whole shtick, isn't it? Mm. They they get inside other people's souls, essentially. Yeah. They can they can play someone so perfectly that they appear to be their, their actual double. Yeah. And that, that is brilliant. And, and uh, at that climax as well, at that climax, after she's defeated Hordak, you know, after Catra has defeated Hordak... It's so emotionally powerful. <laughs> it, it, it is. It's really, really, it knocks the wind out of you, doesn't it? And then yeah. Double Trouble comes in and you think, wait a minute, this hasn't gone the way that it's supposed to go. Nope. And that, and what, what's, I mean, Double Trouble, obviously, all they're doing is, it, it, it's business, isn't it? It was not even business, it's just acting. That's it's, all it is to Double Trouble. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Double yeah, Trouble's, um, Double Trouble's a fascinating character because they, they don't have any morality or loyalty at all. None whatsoever. It's all just about the art. It's the art and the fun, isn't it? Yeah. It's, 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 the, it's the, the crack of it. It's the fun yeah. of it. Um, and I loved that, too. I mean, Double Trouble isn't in it that much. Double Trouble appeared in season four and, yeah. again, could have so easily just been a, a mechanism for, you know, sowing discord amongst the princesses and setting Glimmer against Adora and all that sort of thing. But no, they're not that either. They no. are a character in and of themselves and a really fascinating one. When at the end, in the, you know, towards the end, when Double Trouble escaped, or, or you know, when, when Glimmer says Double Trouble's mm. escaped, I genuinely thought, you know, I, 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 it, 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 I bought it. Yeah, me too. I, I, bought, I didn't yeah. click. I didn't totally click. bought the Double Trouble had escaped because you know they're clever. Yeah, they're very manipulative. It, it doesn't. It, it, it's not unbelievable that Double Trouble not could have escaped, not especially given the fact that the that that um, Bright Moon is falling apart. Yeah. 
So I thought, oh, well, this is, you know, and I, I just assumed that they would go back to to the fright zone and they would, mm. you know, they would turn the tables. Yeah. They didn't because that isn't what that isn't they're what interested happened. in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was, I couldn't believe that Glimmer was that devious. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. But that's, again, you know, it, the whole time, characters never stop growing, do they? No. And that's one of the cool things about it because Glimmer is becoming something completely different to what she was in the beginning she's becoming an adult isn't she she's becoming complex because she again she could have been a very easy very sort of um almost like my little pony stereotype you know she could have been the girly 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 girl but she's not she's not she's got these complexities these edges which of course come to the Uh fore after her mother sacrifices herself Mm. And I think that's something that Glimmer's very conscious of, isn't it? Because I think she genuinely, she feels that people view her that way. Yeah. Because she, and I mean, she says so herself, because she's always needed to recharge. Yeah. She's never been as strong as everybody else. She's always, you know, and also she's always had her mother holding, yeah. not hold, holding her back is unfair because Angela, Angela, sorry, has never deliberately held her back, I don't think. It's always no. been with her best wishes, and her best interest in mind, but nonetheless. Misguided. Yeah, misguided. It's I think misguided, not realizing Glimmer's own strength. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a theme that comes up again and again and again in this show, which is that tension between parents and children, the relationships between guardian figures and children, yeah. and how parent figures are either actively manipulative and abusive and don't have their best interests at heart, like Shadow Weaver and Hordak, ostensibly, or they have their best interests at heart, but they're incompetent. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. They, they. The, I think the, the the repeated thing that keeps coming back is that the kids always know themselves best. Yeah. And yet, no adult will ever credit them with knowing themselves best. Mm-hmm. I mean, another thing that really, and it actually brought me to tears in the one of the last episodes was the Madame Raz thing. Oh God! Well, the, yeah, with Mara oh. and, the, and, and, and and that goddamn pie. She, <laughs> which is, you know, could have so easily just been a oh. joke. And it felt like that because, of course, Madame Raz starts off as this kind of bumbling, kind of you know the the, the wizened old crone, you yeah. know the no the gnomic old woman that yeah. that's you know oh isn't she quirky? Isn't she funny? She's a bit mad. And then you realise in that episode. Oh no, I agree actually. I I I don't cry at things. I am I have a heart of stone. <laughs> I am, but I had a lump in my throat and tears in my eyes when oh. I watched it. And I realised what the significance of it was when I started to get what oh, was God, happening. Yeah. When I started to realise that, you know what, all of this shtick, all of this stuff about, oh, she's a little bit crazy, she's a little bit kooky. No, she's not. No, no she's not. She sees different times. She's she's experiencing time in this atemporal way. Yeah. And it's heartbreaking. <laughs> the worst thing about it is, is that no matter what way she's living it, she can't stop it. No. She can't change it. She has to live, you know, Mara... She has to live Mara over and over again yeah. and know that she can't do anything. And yeah. I think knowing that she can tr- she can try uh, to change what's happening with the door, but she, it's... how does she express? Yeah. Oh. Oh, no, I totally just... agree. Yeah. <laughs> it completely, that episode did for me, I can tell you. I was like, no, this, this show is genuine brilliance. This is yes. genuine brilliance. It's beautiful storytelling. The characters are so, they are so wonderful to be around, <laughs> you know? They are. I felt I... for her, you know? The fact that Mara has already sacrificed herself and she's got to live that again and again and yeah. again and know that she's never coming back. Yeah. And, it, you know, it just even, even daft things like the pie as metaphor, which yeah. shouldn't work. It shouldn't work, but it does. It's, it's really la- cool, isn't it? I it's mean, too it, late. There's no time. And it isn't yeah. the pie. It's never been the pie. It's the you know, time, it's... <laughs> isn't it? It's time seeping away. It's so yeah. clever. It's so clever. It is. Um, inverting that character archetype and turning it into something really profound and really beautiful, which is what it does throughout. It's what yeah. it does throughout. It is absolutely stunning. Um, I mean, one of the, the conversations I've had with people is I, I I hesitate to even begin comparing it to the original show. Yeah. Because, the you know, the original show was what it was. It was... the 
I'll, I'll always have affection for those shows because they, they were part of childhood. They were part of the 1980s, but they, it wasn't designed to tell a story. It wasn't designed to, to provide you with this mythology or with these complex characters or to even teach you lessons that it pretended to. It was designed to sell toys. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So there's no comparison. There's no. just no comparison. The original show in comparison to this is Drek. Oh, it's just hollow, isn't it? Yeah. It's just empty. And I feel the same way, um, again, you know, to go, go back once again to something that we've talked about before, with with Transformers. Yeah. Totally. You know, when you compare the original Transformers cartoon, which, I, you know, I, I really did love that as a kid, yeah, even though it was too. just a completely like... hollow obsessed yeah. with it as a kid how how cool was it when you were obsessed. a kid it was transforming robots that were you know that could they could turn into cars and yeah. planes and spaceships it and they great. made a cool noise when they transformed i mean <laughs> come on cool it was noise. great but, but then in the modern era you know yeah. you've got various takes on it and and more than meets the eye stroke lost light which is <sighs> does for transformers i think <laughs> what she does the new she does for this the same mythology yeah. in the same way yeah I feel like this kind of spiritually, this spiritually the same thing. It's something that's happening throughout children's media. Actually, it's really interesting. There is this sort of like revolution occurring in children's media. You are getting stuff like Steven Universe, which is kind of like one of the earlier examples of this kind of show, which is taking what people presume of certain kinds of children's cartoons and media and completely inverting it mm. and using it to to impart very complex. I when I hesitate to even say lessons because they're not didactic in that way. No, not at all. They're not that didactic. They're not finger wagging. They're not sort of like trying to tell children what they are or what they should do or what they should be. They are just trying to show them the complexities and the ambiguities of existence yeah. and of emotional being. And it's something that's happening again. You've got Adventure Time, which does uh, yeah. a similar yeah. thing, you know? Um, you are getting reincarnations of old cartoons like Transformers. Uh, by the way, the, the, the more present, the more recent Transformers cartoons, a lot of them are very good. You know, Prime was very oh, good. Oh, Transformers Prime, I thought was excellent, actually. Yeah, yeah very, I very really good. I really enjoyed that. Even Beast Wars, which is quite old now, is a, a quantum leap away yeah. from the original cartoon, you know? Um, but it's happening throughout children's media. There is this it seems this urge, this willingness to make good, complex, ambiguous media for children now and to introduce them to images and ideas and concepts that would never have happened in the 1980s or the no, 1990s for that matter. It was always boiled down to, as you said, like easily digestible morals yeah. or easily digestible cautionary tales. You know, you always had these kind of... Like, even, you remember Captain Planet, which was oh, like... Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember Captain Planet. Kind of like the apotheosis of that very concept, wasn't it? You know, it yeah. it was the whole sort of like riding the wave of of um, environmentalism, which was so vogue at the time, but in the worst possible way. Yeah, sort of boiling it down to the most basic thing that you could think of. And then, you know, just expressing in, in such a, again, patronising. It was patronising. Even I even recognised at the time it was patronising because yeah. I was, you know, I was a proper tree hugger of a kid. Yeah, You know, I was very much an environmental, you know, kind of save the planet, save the whales kind of kid. And even I realised that it was extremely patronising. And just a bit cack. You know, as a cartoon, <laughs> just not well put together. I mean, you could, obviously as a kid, you can't really articulate it to yourself, mm. but there, there is something. It, it has lingered as well. People generally dislike Captain Planet. <laughs> it, it, it was so naff, though. It, it was. was. Oh, yeah, there were a lot of naff cartoons around at the time, but Captain Planet was perhaps the most naff. It was probably the epitome of naffness in that regard, wasn't it? It, 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 was, like, it was like the morals at the end of He-Man stretched out to an entire damn episode of a cartoon, yeah. basically. And they always did the same thing. I mean, this is also the thing about Captain Planet, you know, there's this whole thing about, oh, the power is yours. That was the catchphrase, yeah? It's your responsibility to save the world. But the characters, at, at the end, to get over, like, the eco terrorism or to to avoid the catastrophe they just use their magic rings and summon captain planet so there's a <laughs> magical answer to everything 
yeah, the, the, the power is yours, except that actually you don't have power, you no. know. And, and actually, even these kids who can summon wind and fire and water, even they don't have power. They've, they've got, got to call the, they've got to call the, the literal magic guy. Yeah, they're kind of they've impotent, got, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, if there is ever a show that's ripe for a present day remake that could actually be done really well. Captain Planet could be good. It could work, you know. It could. It could. I think it would. It would need to. It would have to be pretty unrecognisable, though. Yeah, I think. It well, would. you know, but then that's what they did with Shira. It you know, is. as we were saying, Shira is not the Shira that you think it is. You know, and it's certainly not what I thought I was going. I was getting when I sat down to watch it. And that was why I was resistant for so long because yeah. I remembered what Shira was. And I thought, mm, is it just going to be the same thing? You know, of course, yeah. then when it, when it started upsetting people, I realised that it wasn't. <laughs> well, I, you know, at least I had the inkling that it wasn't, you know, yeah. I, without actually knowing much about what it was in it. But I could see that people were getting pissed off about it. So I thought, well, clearly it's not the same thing. Yeah, and to its great, great benefit. I mean, it, 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 as I said earlier, it was just curiosity on my part. You know, I just wanted to know what what they were doing with this and what what they could possibly do with the notion of she when it wasn't acting as an adjunct to He-Man. Yeah, absolutely. You know, where it isn't just a, a reference, because, you know, that's another thing that happened in the 1980s all the time. You would get sort of like, there they would be this almost this token feminism, you know, where you would have female characters created that were just knockoffs of the male characters. Yeah. That kind of hollow, you know, okay, it was girl power before we knew what girl power yeah. was, but it was the same kind of thing, isn't it? It's just, yeah, basically we're going to put this male character in a skirt and give and, and, and give him a push-up bra and that's... That's pretty yay. much it. And make them pink. Yeah, make them pink and They've got to be pink. They've got to have a nice pony in there somewhere as well, because everyone loves yes, ponies. Everybody they? loves their ponies, yes. Yeah. Um, Swiftwind, of course. Yeah. Um, who's actually great in the new she Hilarious. Hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever Swiftwind turns up, it's it's going to be a funny grand old time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that happened all the damn time. It was very rare to get actual female characters in 1980s and 1990s cartoon shows. Very rare. Towards the end of the 1990s, you started to get it with cartoons like Avatar. Mm, yes. Like uh, The Legend yeah. of Aang. That was very damn good. That was really kind of like the the beginnings of what would eventually morph and evolve into the, the, the current She-Ra. Yes, yes. You know, where you had actual characters and an actual mythology i mean mythologically again the the shira cartoon does something brilliant with the core concepts of the shira mythology it extenuates it and makes it bigger like for example all of the all of the stuff that's in the original shira cartoon is kind of here it's present it mm. you know the notion of etheria the notion that etheria is in this other dimension called despondos and nobody really knows why it's there and why it's not connected to the the wider universe that Eternia is in. And they make an arc of that. They yeah. give, they, you know, there is a reason for it. And the re I, I love the concept, the notion that that Etheria is actually this engine, this sort of metaphysical engine that could spell the end of all creation. And that it was put there, yeah, put there. As, as, as a measure of safety you know there's a the reason yeah. it's there it's not it's not an accident it was to keep everybody safe yeah i mean that is very cool and uh, now of course that's opened up at the end of the fourth season mm. they're back in the primary universe so could we see eternia now well i don't know this is the interesting thing isn't it because it, it is ripe to open up to other mythologies and because we are where we are mm -hmm. you know we've, we've got we've got a situation where she as far as we can see well uh, the sword is certainly destroyed we it's don't know what that up. means we don't know what that means for our powers but the sword is no longer there so you know what's next glimmer yeah. is glimmer is captured by the horde yeah so um, hordak is is gone i mean he was basically lobotomized wasn't he at yep. the end of the of the show taken to be corrected yeah corrected yeah of course and we had horde prime and his funny eyes turning up <laughs> who horde prime, who's like who's like sexier hordak isn't yeah he? that's exactly what i was thinking <laughs> he is sexier hordak he's like um He's like, you know, whenever you get some, like, action vampire film and there's a sort of ancient vampire lord who's slightly hot. Yeah, 
Yeah, he is, isn't he? Yeah. He's kind of like the alien version of that. He kind of is, yeah. He's like, yeah, he, yeah, yeah I can kind of see why everybody goes for Horde Prime over Horde Act. No offense, Horde Act, but you no, know. You can... But Horde Prime, mm-hmm. and also what I loved about Horde Prime was he was only in it, like, at the very end. Yeah. And you immediately know what he's like. <laughs> yeah, you get you get straight up get a sense of what this dude is and why, also why Horde Act has been in his thrall all this time yeah. as well. Yeah, because he's manipulative, he's mm-hmm. clever, he's charming, uh, massively powerful, clearly. Yep. Uh, but also you get a sense of his philosophy, you know, what he's about. The Horde, again, are not just monsters, they're not just conquerors, they kind of want a sense of law and order in, in the universe. But it's hard to see where it's going now, isn't it? I mean, you had the Horde ships just just all over Etheria. It's all blown completely open, isn't it? So what, it, it, what I like about season, so each of the seasons obviously left a, a, the world in a different place to yes. where it started to some degree. And sometimes but this in a big is, degree. I mean, at the end of season three, the world fell apart and they oh, came back together yeah. again. <laughs> Except that, you know, we'd lost, you know, Angela was gone and yeah. uh, there's uh, the uh, and Trapture have been sent away to Beast Island. So there's, you know, massive. But this is the biggest, by far yeah. the biggest, because this is, you know, the world that we have come to know is not there anymore. It's not, and all the mechanisms are gone as well. Yeah. Like the sword, like the. I mean, I don't know what it means for Shira, because it technically, I mean, it didn't didn't um, Light Hope say something to her along the lines of the power isn't in the sword. Yes, yeah, so it, it, I don't remember her exact words, but yes, there is a very strong implication that the sword is just like a vessel it's like a for power. Point, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not, not the power itself. It's Adora, isn't it? So, and mm. are we going to maybe see a little bit of where Adora comes from? Because of course, in it, we know that the in the original mythology, she's He-Man's sister. She's Adam's sister. So, I mean, is that the case now? I, who knows? It, it, it makes me wonder if we may even it may, may even see elements of He-Man creeping oh, in because, God. as you pointed out, it's weird for She-Ra to exist on its own, isn't it? As a it continuity is without. It is up, but what is that going to mean? Because we've established that I, I'm assuming that the old ones are Eternians. That's yeah, that, that would make sense. Yeah, but yeah. If that's the case, then the Eternians aren't necessarily good people. Mm. Because you know the you know they programmed Light Hope, they created the engine that is Etheria um, to reshape all of reality. So yeah, I mean they're basically colonizers, aren't they? Really, yeah. that's 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 what they are in the worst possible way. You know, <laughs> yeah. so what does that mean? What do, I mean, are we going to see some new dynamic coming? Could we see Skeletor? I'd kind of love to see Skeletor, actually. We, this version of Skeletor, this universe's version of Skeletor. Oh. It would be interesting because if they managed to do with Hordak what they have done with him, yeah. and turn him into like a three-dimensional, complex, fascinating mm. character, imagine what they could do with Skeletor. Oh, I'm so up for that. <laughs> so I'm nice. so up for that because you know the the boyhood part of me still has a real thing for Skeletor. I mean, we all do. I, I've actually got a lapel uh, badge on my lapel at the moment, which is a Live, Laugh, Love Skeletor badge, which I got <laughs> as, a, as, a, as an early Christmas gift, which is just, you know, I love it. It's beautiful. Uh, awesome. I, you know, I mean, th- there are versions of Skeletor out there that are actually kind of interesting. I mean, in the, the 2002 cartoon, you get to see him as he used to be. Right. He was, a, he was a guy called Keldor, and um, they make him really hot. <laughs> I don't know what the the crack is, but he's blue and he's really, really, really hot. I don't know I'm what the. Watch this now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fun. I mean, it's nowhere near, and I mean, it is nowhere near what this show is. It's it's no it's nowhere near as complex, but it is a lot of fun. It's much more of a sort of comic booky you know like boys show really yeah um, yeah but it does have stuff in it it does have this really wonderful mythology where it goes into like where the power comes from you know the power right. that makes adam into he-man and how skeletor became skeletor and the, the one of the most interesting relationships in that is the the relationship between evil lynn and skeletor right because it's really complex it's massively complex you just don't know like what the dynamic is between them it's so interesting the way that, you know, we, we, we just accept that TV shows in the 80s just had no complexity. There was no, no you know, they just, they were just so basic and they so... They so were. I mean, the characters were just visuals. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, mean, I get were. that a lot of them were because it, it was 
vehicles for toys you know i understand that as an adult but it's weird that as a kid we didn't just think wow this is garbage i guess we had nothing to compare it to i I think that's it for a lot of us these may have been the first stories we ever came across so they stuck you know yeah the imagery and the the concepts just stuck somewhere but what i love is the people who were kids in the 1980s have taken it on board and have said actually i'm kind of dissatisfied with that yeah and have turned it into what they wanted it to be or maybe what they imagined it being and that's why, you know, to go back again to, to the people who complain about you've changed it now, it sucks. Mm. Then the kind of weird misplaced nostalgia of oh, yeah. this show was great. I mean, it was never great. Let's be real great. here. Yeah. You know, you're getting upset about the character change, the design change, the animation change, the story change. But it, there was nothing. To, it was hollow. It was exactly. just there visuals. Was, there was nothing to change, really, yeah. you know. Um, and it, what I think what people have a difficulty with is that it's OK for something to be terrible and to still have some sentiment for it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's OK to admit, actually, you know, I, I, I can admit that 80s Transformers was kind of garbage. Oh, but it's I still, so bad. You watch it. Still now. It's so it. bad. Yeah, me too. There are a couple of episodes of that that are just, you know, so bad that I, I uh, laugh hysterically. Yeah, there's um, one called Carnage in C minor. Oh, that's amazing. And oh. no, my favourite my, my favorite will always be Autobop. Oh, it's, it's inexplicable. That, that things happen that you just, you just, why is this happening? I don't yeah. understand. And they build, the, the, the Decepticons are building a building for some reason. And at the end, <laughs> they don't think, maybe we could use this building. In, <laughs> So, no, no, we're just going to demolish it. Yeah. Nothing yeah. that happens in that episode is a logical decision. I, and I watched it recently and just thought, this is so bad. But it, it's amazing. Yeah. It's a brilliant piece of TV because it's just the worst thing I've ever watched. Uh-huh. Yeah, I totally get it. I really do. <laughs> and, you know, it's... Oh, Carnage in C minor, yeah. I feel the same way about <laughs> Carnage in C minor is brilliant. Yeah. It, it's like every sin of that cartoon writ large. Yeah. The, the the sheer half arsedness of the <laughs> of the writing the the, the, the animation, animation. Oh. things just changing size for no reason yeah. the, you know, wrong voices are coming out of the wrong characters yeah. it's just, the, the it's... lip flaps of one character moving while another one is talking all of that stuff yeah it just never stops in that episode it just doesn't and yet there are still those episodes that are just cool because <laughs> i like seeing certain bots turn up you know yeah there's like the episodes towards the end, the rebirth, where you have the headmasters and all of that. Oh, I, I never garbage. really got to watch the headmasters um, continuity because I think it was it was Japanese, wasn't it? Mainly. Well, the there is there's there's like two of them. There's there's the the, the Japanese headmasters, which is god awful. Oh, is it bad? <laughs> oh, it's worth watching because the dub is the best worst thing you'll ever hear in your life. It is like uh, just get the office temp to do all the voices <laughs> basically and then there's the american one which is only three episodes long and it's the it's the end of that cartoon it's just the end of it which is bad but actually probably some of the best of those episodes it's it's quite <laughs> fun you know um it is just a case of like oh we've got the 1987 toy catalog out cram as many of them in there <laughs> as you can and just don't explain it <laughs> Just don't explain it. You've suddenly got all of these new Autobots that turn up and these new Decepticons, and we're, we're just not going to explain it. God, we were so we were so hard done by as kids, weren't we? This is this is what we had. This is all we had. <laughs> it's what we had to work with, unfortunately. I mean, and I yet... will say this: I I watch stuff like like Avatar, like the new Shira cartoon, like um, uh, Over the Garden Wall, like yeah. um, Steven Universe, and I I do envy kids who grow up with that as their input. Oh, for sure. And it's but not even just because it's a better cartoon, but it's being able to see something of yourself in your world yeah. in a cartoon. You know, it's it's because the one thing that I always found when I was growing up as a weird kid was that you never you never saw yourself. There was, you know, adventures happen to cool or interesting or normal children yeah. or otherwise cool or interesting, normal children putting unusual situations. But, you know, the weird kids never go. And then, you know, what I, what I love about um uh, Shira is that everyone is a little bit weird or a little bit defective or a Every little bit. Every character yeah. is like a weird kid, aren't they? They're, they're Basically, this, they, you know, um, what's I can never remember her name, but Seahawks. Mamista. Mamista. And uh, she's like the goth kid, you know? She, she, she is what I was. As a kid. The I goth kid, her. but way too into her novels. Yeah. You know, there's that one episode where, where she turns it into a, like, like, a, like a Nancy Drew kind of mystery <laughs> novel. Yeah. 
<laughs> and she points and the lightning strikes. Yeah, and yeah. she gets super dramatic. But it actually turns out that she was right all along. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> and then you yeah, see so you've got her and then you've got Froster who, when she's introduced, she thinks she's this kind of awesome child prodigy and it turns out she just really wants to be liked. Yeah. And she yeah. just wants to hang around with Glimmer because Glimmer's so cool. <laughs> you know, it's just none of them. You know, they're, they're all extremely competent. They're all extremely good, but they're all dorks in their own yeah, way. And that's great. They're all great. very flawed. They're all slightly... They've all got their own neuroses going on, haven't they? Yes. About, like, their situations. And, uh, yeah, it's brilliant. It is absolutely brilliant. And it draws them so clearly, so well, that you don't need, like sequences where it's telling you that oh this is this character and this is her flaw and this is this character and this is her flaw it develops naturally through the relationships yeah. and I just, it's I just all just built that. in and it's all the way the, the way they interact with one another you know it yeah. doesn't have you know you don't need a special episode obviously you had that the episode where i was talking about where uh my mister is kind of going full nancy drew but that's it but it's in yeah. context isn't it it's, it's not like here's a special mister episode it's no. just this is her time to shine yeah yeah this is just like who she is it's how yeah. it, it feels totally natural it's like yeah she is this oddly bookish character who would have read all of these books and will yeah. probably get well into this situation and who's not enthusiastic about anything in the world except for this weirdly <laughs> yeah. because this is her this is her thing uh, you know it's it's just uh, and i think what's remarkable about shiro as well and this is rare for me uh-huh. is that there is not a single character that i don't like yeah who's who's like annoying yeah you yeah don't... like you know there's always a character that you're like oh i can't stand that character yeah. i hate it when they're on screen there's not one not a in one. the entirety of she that i roll my eyes at when they're on screen there's ever. no cowl who was I like got... the, the token orco character of the she oh party. god jesus yeah i actually remember that now or, or yeah. god, as well there's not one of them yeah thankfully there isn't one of them um because i, mean, I think that's because they let them all be human yeah, they let them be who they are. I mean, the one that really started the ball rolling for me, the one where I really started to think, God, this is this is actually really complex, was Entraptor. Love Entraptor, yeah. She is... I mean, oh, she's God. a great character in so many ways, but the way that she, so, so she's left behind, isn't she? Yes. But she... She doesn't see it that way. She just thinks, oh, this is part of the adventure. You know, I'm, I'm just living in these vents and she, messing around with robots. And She's her own character to such a degree that nothing phases her. She's not in the, the the world that everyone else operates in. To the point whereby, you know, you get those very irreverent interactions she has with Hordak. Mm. You know, where she invades his sanctum all the time and she talks to him as though he's just a, a guy. Yeah, and, and, and sort of criticises his technology and the yeah. things that he's doing wrong in a way that no one else would... Yeah. You would think nobody else would survive that, except yeah. that for some reason... And this is, this is obviously... Through Entraptor, you get the the kind of humanization of Hordak, yeah. which is which I really loved. I, oh, I, I loved that for whole... me, that was one of the best things. <laughs> and heart and heartbreaking, so yeah. heartbreaking. You know, when I, he I, realizes, I was what furious Catra's at Catra. Yeah, but I mean, there's a twofold, isn't there? So first of all. Catra makes him think that she betrayed him. Yeah, which is and you can you literally see Hordak's heart break on screen, yeah. and that was terrible that was awful that yeah. was oh geez, i hated catcher at that moment i was like Spies i hate there for you it. i hate you so much how could you do this and then yeah. and then as you said you get that bit where actually he realizes it was never in Traptor. Yeah. It, it was always catcher and I that is just heartbreak on heartbreak the show doesn't make a muchness of it you get a, a, that, that wonderful image on screen of hordak where he's snarling and there are tears in his eyes yes and that's the only time you've ever seen that reaction from yeah. him. You know, it's because it's always been anger. Yeah. Always. Even when he's vulnerable, he's angry. And yeah. then you see that and you think, holy shit, this yeah. is how much, you know, he, this is the first time you've seen him hurt, yeah. I think. You are the damaged male. That's who he is, yeah. isn't it? You know, he's the guy who's never been able to express anything. He's always been told to be tough, to be, you know, men are like this, that you are supposed to be like this because you are a soldier of the horde, you know? Yeah. Um, so you can't express yourself except through anger. Yeah. Um, and that's, it's just not, it doesn't, it's not sufficient. It doesn't uh, express the entirety of who he is. And if, if Entraptor had been around long enough, if were it not for Catra betraying her, then maybe there could have been some diplomacy, you know? Yeah. Her, her, her kind of, she's kind of the true uh, definition of chaotic neutral, isn't she? Yeah. Oh, totally. Because she doesn't is, care. No, she has <laughs> just, no alignment whatsoever. It's no, just 
what is interesting to her no morality whatsoever she doesn't care about morality she cares about she's the kind of character who would break the universe to see what pretty shapes it would make yeah Except that, that actually we say that, but there's that one moment when she realises it's the portal. I think it's, and I think it probably is more the portal's not ready, so I'm not going to get to see yeah. what it does. But she does say stop, doesn't she? Yes, she, she does. does, and it's Catra who stops her from stopping it, if I yeah. remember correctly. Um, Although but... actually, yeah, now you say that, I don't even think that is an act of morality. I think that is an act of it's not ready yet. It's going to break, and I want to actually see it. So can yeah, we stop? I don't... <laughs> I don't want to go boom with the universe. I want to see what's going to happen. Yeah. 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 Um, and I love that about her. You know, she there again, the temptation would have been to make her a villain. Yeah. And it doesn't happen. A villain or else in, in the same mold as Scorpio, just comic yeah. relief. Yeah. And she has moments like that. But oh, then, she's funny she, as hell. But she's also indispensable. Yeah. She, she's she, the only reason they got off Beast Island is because of her. Yeah, she she is a key part of like every every time she turns up, she's a key part of the narrative. You know, Hordak wouldn't have got his portal working without her. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely, she is a really interesting character, and I I, I absolutely loved everything about her. You know, whenever she turned up, usually dangling upside down from her hair. <laughs> Yeah, or like picking something up with her hair. Yeah. <laughs> I think what I like about her as well is that she's quite obviously meant to be some form of neuro neurodiver neurodivergent, sorry, character. She so is. She you so know, is. Whether she's operating on uh, some sort of autistic or Asperger's spectrum, but like, that's never ever a weakness. It's never no. a weakness. You know, it's in fact, if anything, it's her greatest strength. Yeah, it's who she is. Isn't that it? She doesn't see the world the way that anybody else does. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and people love her for it. She's respected for it. Mm -hmm. And actually, she, as you say, all, all the great things that Hordak does comes from her. All these great things, you know, they, they couldn't have got off Beast Island without her and, and specifically without the way that her brain works. Yeah, she is. It, it's, it's that thing the show does once again where it doesn't make a muchness of someone's idiosyncrasies. They are who mm. they are. That is their personality, and people accept them for that, and even venerate them for it. I mean, Hordak, one of the, the, the faculties that Hordak has early on, before he starts to lose it anyway, is that he sees qualities in people. Yes. It's like when he promotes Catra over Shadow Weaver. Yeah. It's because he sees her drive and her ambition and the fact that she has this vendetta and he can use it, you know? When he stops himself from just either kicking uh, Entrapped her out or maybe even harming her for invading his sanctum, um, he sees in her potential. Yeah. He's I, very... He's, again, he, for a villain, again, he, and as somebody who's not necessarily attuned to emotion himself, he, again, has an emotional intelligence, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, he sees emotion in others. He sees how it works, and he sees yeah. how to to channel it. I suppose exploit, we might say, in the in the, in the early on, we might say exploit. Yeah. But yes, he's it's very interesting, and, and Catra's like that to an extent as well. Except that Catra's is always always never necessarily seeking out the the positive emotions. It's always how can I exploit your negative emotion? Yeah. How can I exploit your weakness? Hordak is not necessarily Hordak is. Yeah, there is. How can I exploit your weakness? But there's also how can I use your strength? Yeah. How can I emphasize your strength? Catra, yeah. it's always vicious. Yeah. It's always she's always seeking the weak point, the chink in the armor, and she wants it so she can be sadistic. Yeah. Ultimately. Because she has to control. Yeah. That's the thing that the difference between Hordak and Catra is that Hordak doesn't mind relinquishing control if it means that the you know if the greater good yeah will come from that so he doesn't mind letting catra do her thing or or entrap to take over the the sanctum if it means that he will reach his goals with catra is absolutely no question that anybody is in control other than her oh yeah she i mean she there is basically no given. she disempowers hordak quite yeah. significantly she kind of becomes the the driving impetus of the horde at one point yeah, absolutely. Although what I find interesting about that is that it, it, there are moments where you realise that the power differential is still kind of in Hordak's corner, isn't it? You know, she might be nominally in charge, mm -hmm. but Hordak is still ultimately, be because he's got this Horde Prime trump card yeah. up his sleeve and always, you know, that that's not going away. No, he's always, and also, I mean, 
he's always going to have all of the technology and whatnot on his side, isn't he? You yeah. know? It's when he gets going at the end of season four, you know, when he really starts to basically conquer Etheria and she realizes that she set something in motion that she maybe can't control to the same degree. Yeah. And then she goes looking for Scorpia for reinforcement and doesn't find it. Yeah. And then now she has nobody. She's she has nothing, nobody yeah. and she has nothing. Well, she's, she's nothing at all. Yeah. Yeah. She's alienated everyone even the person who was her most ardent supporter is gone i love the bit where um uh, is it lonnie uh, uh the, the, you know the three three yeah, books we talked about yeah. before when even they walk out and even they're done yeah, and that's and a really actually... powerful moment isn't it because you never see that in in these narratives you never see those kind of yeah those kind of mook characters they they just infinitely put up with shit yeah. And at a certain point, all three of them have just turned around. Even, even um, Kyle, yeah. who is like the ultimate, you know, jelly-spined, useless. Even he turns around and says, no, we're just done. Yeah, we're, we're done not with having it, it. In fact, doesn't he interpose himself between Catra and the he other does. one? He actually says, no, you're not doing this. He does, which is the first time you ever see him react like that. Yeah. It's which is very fascinating. cool. Again, you know, there, there you are again. You know, it's, it's it, the, the, the amount of character development, even with arguably the most minor characters. Yeah, I mean, the characters who are... It's just the comic foils, you know? They have their own arc, they have their own developments, and it it, it it actually has payoff. Yeah. You never see that in this kind of cartoon. You never see it. But again, it's symptomatic of what is happening in children's media. There is a kind of revolution occurring to the point whereby it's often more complex and more interesting than material that's ostensibly aimed at adults. I agree. This is actually one of the first... TV shows I've watched in a long time that I've had this degree of re- uh, response to, you know, and that includes a lot of adult media. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know why that is, but I think it just seems to, I don't know, I think it just seems to have an understanding of, uh, it matches my understanding maybe, is what, is what I mean, you know, a lot of adult media is is very specific in the way that it views the world and it's yeah. not necessarily how i view the world but she is sort of saying something that i can understand yeah i, I totally Maybe. agree i it's the emotional response more than anything that surprised me certainly mm. in season four i mean all of the seasons have been very powerfully emotional but season four really drove me over the edge on several different points yeah. Uh, and on several different occasions, I just couldn't get enough of it. I could not get enough of it. I devoured it like voraciously, you know. Um, and th- there's just not much out there that does that at no, this no. point. I think it's very brave of them to have set this world up over three series and then see in season four just dismantle it completely. Yeah. Well, not even dismantle it so much as just you know you know press the trigger and watch it. Watch it burn, you know. Watch it's... it burn, yeah. And I, I just don't know. I mean, assuming there is going to be another season, I sincerely hope there is. I wonder what they're going to do. It's so wide open, isn't it? But I trust. I do. This is the thing. They, 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 they bought my trust and they've won yeah. my trust, and I trust that whatever happens will be. Will, will have a, a good, not only a good reason, but the, the payoff will be there as well. Yeah. I, I do trust that. And I hope that there is an ending in sight. Yes, you know, it's not just going to be one of those shows that infinitely goes on uh, and on and on. And then just gets cancelled. Yes, oh God, that'd be, yeah, that'd be a terrible thing to happen, That would actually. be heartbreaking, because, you know, I, there were times, certainly in season four, when I thought this is going to be the end, you know, this is, this is going to be the end of the show, it's all going to finish here. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, clearly there is something to resolve beyond this. So, I don't know. And I- I feel like it's it's more than a se- more than a season's worth of story as well. Well, there's so much to do, isn't there? There's so much to set up now. I mean, the horde has got to be dealt with, and that's going to be difficult. Hordak's going to come back at some. Oh, of course, some... Hordak will come back. It'll be in Traptor, won't it? I think it will be. It'll be in Traptor, yeah. and that'll be so back. appropriate. Yeah, I hope so. I sincerely hope so, and I hope you get. I hope there's a little bit of either reconciliation or retribution. For him and Hall yeah. Prime, you know, um, but I, I can't. I, I'm very fascinated to see where it goes from here. I really, and how they can, how they can maintain the current quality, and how they can maybe even better it. But that's the thing, isn't it? It's it has got better and better and better. And that was when I was. I mean, I binge watched it very, you know, yeah, it, within yeah. within the space of two weeks, I watched <laughs> all of it, and was you know d- desperately disappointed when there was no more of it. Yeah, but um. 
it has got better and better. It hasn't. The quality has not suffered. It feels like they're there. They haven't. I wonder if they've even fully hit their stride yet, because it yeah. felt like Series Four was has been the pinnacle so far. But I, I, I can't help but wonder if there's even more to come yet. Wow. Well, I mean, I can only hope so. And you're right. It's, it's, it hasn't been disappointing. <laughs> it hasn't. Once. It not hasn't, once has it disappointed me. No, I've even loved some everything. of the. Even some of the episodes that you might refer to as slower episodes, mm-hmm. every single one of them has done something or told told some key story point or just been fun, just been yeah. good to watch. And some of the episodes are just fun. Yeah, you know, and that's great because you need that too. Like, it's, you know, mytho- you've got mythology-heavy episodes and then you've mm-hmm. got, like, I guess, you know, in the old X-Files parlance, you'd call it Monster of the Week. And I guess yeah. you have got that kind of thing going on here as well. It's just, you know this mission of the week and it's usually to do with liberating some place or yeah. fight some threat and that's fine too because it doesn't always need to in fact i actually think that's one of its great strengths is it doesn't try and cram too much story in no it's it's leavened very well isn't it it like is it's, it's punctuated well so it knows it, it it's looking at itself as a wider story it's really quite clever so it knows when it needs to just let it rest a little bit and just yeah. be a little bit funnier or a little bit lighter before it starts dropping the really heavy stuff on you again yeah yeah it's it's very very good at that or making you feel like there's a sense of equilibrium before it drops you again it's, <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, everything's fine now. No, it's not. I lied. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just... It understands contrast, doesn't it? It understands, like, yeah. that in order for the, the moments of gravity to have real gravity, to have real pathos, you need the light moments. You need the moments where everything's okay or where it's just, like, it is just the monster or the mission of the week. Yeah. I mean, would, would Madame, Madame Raz's, you know, the reveal there have been anywhere near as devastating if you hadn't spent four, uh, you know, four seasons thinking she was just a quirky old woman? Absolutely not. I mean, that's it. That is probably one of the best examples. If it, and also if it had foreshadowed it too much. Yeah. yeah. I, I, what I loved is there, there was basically no foreshadowing, except no. that when you look back, only, only when you gain that knowledge do you realise what the foreshadowing was. That's how clever it is. It's very clever, isn't it? And actually now, it's worth going back and watching certainly the Madame Raz episodes yeah. to see what she says and what yeah. actually makes a lot of sense now that didn't before. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all, everybody's sort of just disregarding her because she's a mad, quirky old lady. And it makes you wonder how things could have changed. Mm-hmm. C- could they have? Who knows? It's, it's difficult to tell, but it's it's certainly you do think could how much could have, could have been avoided if we just listened to her. If we just sat down and listened to her. <laughs> then again, of course, you get the whole dichotomy there, don't you? Because she's operating in several different times at once. So that kind yes. of suggests there's a kind of predestination going on. It does, doesn't it? That, 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 that there is, it wouldn't have made a difference because yeah. that's just how things are supposed to be. That's how things are. And yeah. Raz's issue is that she's she's perceiving time in this very fractured way. She, you know, she's in the future, she's in the past, she's in the present, and loads of different probabilities all at once. Yeah. Which is great. I mean, it's a great way of taking that character and making her interesting. It's very, very good. Yeah, she's 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 a fantastic character, and I'm I'm glad that she was kind of the centre of it, actually, looking yeah. back. Yeah, but um, I, I, I don't know how many ways I can say, like, just how good <laughs> this show is. It's so worth watching. I mean... I, I, I can't really emphasize to the audience enough. It's a brilliant show. There may be issues that you have, like if you don't like the aesthetics or the, the style of animation they've gone with, or maybe some of like the, the occasional humor might get on your nerves or something, but give it time and give it a chance. Cause I, I guarantee you'll find an amazing story here. Absolutely. I think it's, it's yeah. And I think give it a chance is, is my kind of, my take home here because i went in just expecting something that was going to be a little bit fun yeah and for the first three or four episodes that's that's what i got Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden i realized that actually this is shows a lot more than that and as as the series wore on and as the episodes wore on i kind of came to understand actually what kind of show i was watching that i did i had no awareness of that that it was that kind of show yeah. in the very beginning so yeah definitely it is something to seek out but but be patient yeah stick with it it hits time it doesn't take long to hit its stride, but it rewards you if you if you just are going with an open mind and a little bit of patience. Yeah, absolutely. it really rewards you. <laughs> oh, to the power of N. I mean, you get what you just wouldn't expect. 
Yeah. It throws stuff at and also pay attention to it because a lot of the stuff is a lot of the complexities are not spelled out. So you need to look at like the way, like Catra's facial expressions, for example. Mm, yeah. The, the the little sidelong glances or the the expressions of frustration or whatnot. The way she speaks when she's speaking to Adora when they're fighting and it's slightly flirty and slightly like bitchy and backbiting. All of that stuff is really important. It's re- and it's so well done. It really is, yeah. It's it, the, the, nothing is wasted, is it? It's no. you know, all the character development down to the even down to the silly jokes. Oh yeah, some of the silly jokes actually have payoff. You know, they have resonance within the wider story. So, it's worth paying attention to practically everything. Yeah, and none of the characters are redundant. Every single character that is focused on, there is a reason for them to be there. There's yep. no, there's no. Oh, let's just put this guy in for for reasons you know everybody, <laughs> everybody is there for a reason yeah they have payoff they have yeah. um and they often have story arcs that are meaningful and really really good is well done well written yeah. you know um i it, it's odd to think isn't it that we're sitting here in 2019 praising a, a she-ra cartoon you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's i a, certainly wouldn't have thought yeah if you'd asked me six months ago i no. certainly thought i'd be doing it but here i am it's and legitimately you know and i and i'm somebody whose tastes in media are probably similar to yourself tend to run towards dark oh yeah things and and adult themes and sort of more um so she on the surface looks very colorful and looks very cheerful and looks very and you know i i kind of it makes me sad to think that i might have missed out on it just because i might have written it off based on the fact that it is a little bit cutesy and i mean and actually to be honest even the animation i don't think i don't think of it as being cutesy and overly colorful anymore now that i've watched it now that you've watched it yeah it's it's, it's very clever in of itself uh actually yeah it's um it's such an interesting exercise. I've I've no I've very rarely come across anything quite like it. What, what I would say is if you if if you guys had some reaction to the likes of Avatar or The Legend of Korra or or Adventure Time or Over the Garden Wall, if you like animation, this this is something quite special. Yeah, and I actually I would also recommend Shira to anime fans as well. Yes, I feel like I actually feel like it's a very it's actually a very Western take on anime. It does have like um, there is ob- the obvious magical girl influence. Yes, there really is. There's definitely a bit of a Madoka kind of feel, isn't there? The oh. uh, uh, be careful what you wish for kind of totally, the, totally. The, yeah, the, right the down girl. to the, the the you know the the rehashed transformation you know it's all there it's all part of this universe but again it kind of takes that trope and it inverts it and does very interesting things with it um because it's aware it's very aware of what its influences are it's it's super aware and i I wouldn't be surprised if it does have um anime influences in there because it is it's definitely playing with with i mean even the animation style sometimes it it, it conscious like the facial expressions consciously echo those kind of slightly over the top anime expressions especially it's, when it's being a bit more comedic i mean there, there yeah. are definitely moments between Bo and um oh i, I forgot his name the sea captain um, seahawk yeah seahawk. yeah you know, it, it dips directly Where Bo almost goes full on heart eyes you know and yeah, he's, 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 he's totally. got a, the, the, the the genki girl sparkle thing going on it's, yeah, it's brilliant. it happens yeah, all yeah. the time all yeah. the, and also the action sequences as well the action sequences have some very clear resonance with sort of japanese anime action sequences yeah so, yeah it will appeal to a lot of people in a lot of different ways and you know i understand the the reaction that oh you know i liked it when i was a kid and i probably won't like this one just just put it aside put aside the one that you knew as kid as, as a child and just appreciate this for what it is yeah it's its own entity and for a good reason yeah totally it totally <laughs> is and i really can't recommend it highly enough likewise <laughs> <laughs> and i think that might be a good note to end it on do you have any uh, any closing thoughts laura no, I just want to tell everyone to watch it. That's yeah, all. <laughs> that's pretty much it, isn't it? Just, just go. It's on Netflix right now. All four seasons are up there. Just go and watch it. It's, it's damn good. You will feel bereft when it's over and you realise that yeah. you've finished the for all four series and there's nothing else in the in, nothing... in the foreseeable future. Well, that's that's a really good like. Um, it, it's a good marker of its quality. Isn't oh, it, it is. It's... Yeah, yeah. It's very rare that I watch a show and actually feel physically pained that yeah. there isn't more of it, and I did in this. 
you like being around these characters. You like being in this universe. And when it's over, you do feel kind of sad. Yeah, you really do. They're just there's such appealing characters. Even the you know, let's say even the even the villainous characters are so appealing and so great to spend time with that you just oh it's over, that's it, it's yeah. done. Oh, I need it's... more. I want to find out what happened to Hordak. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> but I need to know now. Need it's to just, know. This, this is exactly why fan fiction was invented. Yeah. Yeah. This is this kind of show is why fan fiction was invented because I am going to go off and I'm going to speculate wildly on paper now. I can imagine that there are reams of fan fiction out there about this. I I imagine there are re- in various different types and forms. What do you think I'm going to do? Spend my spend my Christmas holiday doing? I I'm going to scour our kind of our own for all the good shit. Oh, I'll bet there's <laughs> loads of it out there. Um, is there anything you'd like to uh, to pimp out to the people out there, Laura? Oh, I'm gonna just pimp what I usually pimp. You yeah. know, I've I've got a short story collection. It's called Sing Your Sadness Deep. It's got spooky stuff. You might like it. You know all about that, ladies and gentlemen. You you you've heard of that a lot <laughs> on this show. And I, and I, and I can only apologise for constantly talking about it, but it's kind of no, all I've got I right constantly now. talk about it. There's a couple of my <laughs> you know my video game let's plays where I bring it up. You know, it it just keeps cropping up again and again and again. Um, is, is there anything else, by the way? That's all for now. That's, no, that's all. The, uh, uh, sing your any... sadness deep, ladies and gents. That is going to be down there in the uh, down below in the bar thingy. Um, links to to purchase. Uh, as for myself, just the usual. You can find me hanging around here on the Exaggerated Elegy channel, and um, you can also find my work at StrangePlaygrounds.com and knocking around Amazon. There's a uh, my short story collection, Born in Blood, Volume One, that I'm really pleased with. That's knocking about, and you can find me at Enigmatic Elegy on Twitter. Um, and with that, I think we'll get out of here, Laura. So thank you so so much. Thank you for having me as always. No, it's been a blast as as always. I, we, I so wanted to talk to somebody about this show. I've literally just been sitting here the whole week going, oh, <laughs> I can't wait to talk about Sheba. Uh, <laughs> brilliance. Absolute brilliance. And thank you guys so much for listening. Um, until next time. Bye bye. <laughs> Ha 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 